Okay, first something for you. This is not a crutch, it's a tool. Okay? Just, you know, for those of us that like to use our notes, because we're afraid of how long we're going to talk. Um, how do you turn the light on? Oh, there we go. Thank you very much. Lovely. It's a little dark up here. But first of all, hello, Kansas City! <laughs> I I have to tell you that Kansas City, Missouri, actually, has a huge, huge place in my heart for a really, um, I'll just tell you why. Um, This is where I first realized, actually, that my sometimes sort of difficult to define work um, was translating beyond the South Bronx, where I was born and raised. Um, I was invited here back in December 2007 by my friends Lynn Hinkle and Janet Baker and Jason Parson to speak at the library about green-collar jobs and the work that I've been doing up in the South Bronx. And, uh, you know, I got there, and it was this, you know, pretty cold, really early morning, and the library, beautiful place, was, like, filled. It was overflowing. And, um, it was packed even at that hour, and I couldn't really believe that. But the people that came up to me afterward were just this wonderful selection of really interesting, really smart people, planners, architects, um, community activists, engineers even, um, <laughs> elected officials, you know, and they were all found value in, in my talk and really appreciated, all for very, very different reasons. But it was the same talk. And I was just like, wow. You guys are really smart, number one, but also it just helped me realize, like, wow, there is something to this. And so I actually am so, so grateful because there I was, I was, I already ran, was running, started, you know, this uniquely successful environmental justice solutions organization, Sustainable South Bronx. And, you know, nobody would have blamed me for being content to just to stay there for a really long time. But you guys did for me. You inspired me to recognize that I could actually move beyond that and stretch myself, kind of the way that Ted helps us do. And so for that, I am eternally grateful, and I will love you all forever. (laughs) And, you know, those silly folks from the coast, they call this a flyover state. I'm like, dude, y'all need to come and really see what's in here. Period. So thank you again. So, but besides, you know, Kansas City, Missouri, another seminal moment in my life was actually TED 2006. You know, I am from this poor black family, born a poor black girl. And, um, you know, I grew up in the South Bronx when it was burning, and it was absolutely true. I watched it burn around me. And there I was, this little old me, you know, up on this stage at this, you know, conference, this, you know, billionaire's boys club that I like to call it. And, uh, you know, I didn't even know what it was when folks, when I was invited to go. I was just like, cool, I get a chance to like leave February in New York City when it's cold to go to sunny Monterey. That's all I was thinking. And um, I was pretty psyched, you know, come on. And, uh, but there I was, you know, this sort of like really, you know, fairly aspiring figure, you know, in the environmental movement that actually sometimes didn't recognize the work of people like me. And, uh, but it was from that stage where I did call to task uh, yeah, the only person in, in history who was vice president, Nobel laureate, um, and won an Oscar. You know, call them to task about not including lots of other people in the climate change discussion because, frankly, I knew he could do better. And um, because there's always room for improvement. And so, but I did try to be generous and great, graceful and give people something to think about rather than just tell them what to think. Um, and I want to hope I'll do some of that here tonight. Um, without Al Gore sitting in the front row, of course, but um, he should be here if you ask me. But Al Gore's former boss actually said something that really still to this day resonates with me, and it's that there will never be a time between, or excuse me, there'll never be a distance or no distance between where we are and where we ought to be. And the TED team actually also did something really crazy back in 2006. They put it out, on the World Wide Web for free. The annual TED conference is still obviously real expensive, and uh, but utterly priceless. But the TED online thing, they did something really crazy. They put it online, took this really un- incongruous step of by take, giving away something of great value, the TED Talks, and then they increased the demand at the same time. So much so that now people want to create their own TED experience, and thus here we are today. People want that priceless part. You know, They really want 
to be there experiencing it. So there you have 20, 20th century Tet was actually quite single purpose. It had one, that's it. You know, if you had money and the connections and the time, you could go, and if you didn't, it kind of sucked to be you. Um, however, <laughs> 21st century TED is a completely different story. It is now multi-purposed. An example of how we really ought to think about doing everything in the future. In a way, TED was liberated. And because ideas really want to be free anyway just like people. And, uh, it, but a greater sense of equality was actually reached for. And millions, including all 500 or so of you, actually reached back to accept it. And there will probably still never be a time when there's no distance between where we are and where we ought to be. But we can, and we always can think about doing better. So to that end, you know, I actually am always asked to be a part of these uh, uh, lots of different forums, a task force, and you know, groups like that regarding climate change, the environment, green collar jobs. You know, all those super, super important things. And you know, I often find myself on the diversity or the equity or the community track um, because I'm black and female and not rich, at least not yet. <laughs> so. And I love, but I have to say, I love that people, you know, in, the, in p positions of influence are actually at a point where they're going, oh, well, you know, maybe this stuff is really important because, you know, it wasn't that long ago when it wasn't. So that's a really cool thing. But the next step, I think, in the evolution of it is really coming to understand that putting, you know, diversity and equality and community in these little silos is actually sort of tantamount in keeping them in intellectual ghettos. Now, I'm a big fan of the ghetto. I don't have a problem with it. But when you silo things like that out, you are sort of taking away you know, some beautiful things that actually will help us to be integrated with each other. So but I really believe that if you insert the argument for equality into every important discussion about the past and the future of our society, then we will all benefit in some really, really important ways. So, to that end, one time, you know, I was meeting with, with the one particular, particularly August group, and on the subject of climate change, and I put together this small questionnaire. And you know what, I might as well just do it with you guys, just because I wanted to make sure that, you know, we were all kind of on the same page. And I, at least I thought so. So anyway, the questionnaire was something like this. Do you believe that some people should breathe dirtier air than others? Do you believe that some people should drink contaminated water? Or do you believe some, that um, environmental burdens are equally distributed throughout the U.S. population? Do you believe that if energy, transportation, agriculture, and waste infrastructure was cited near affluent people as easily as it is cited near poor people, would it look the same as it does today? Okay. <laughs> do you believe that environmental burdens affect poor people more than affluent ones? Do you believe that the current design of our energy, transportation, agriculture, and waste infrastructure are leading causes of our global climate crisis? Yes. Now, I assumed, as clearly you all did, that, um, <laughs> that the first few questions, you know, would be, people would answer with a resounding no. And the last two would, of course, be yeses. And that little experience taught me something that I really should learn quicker. One should never make assumptions. Because some of the participants literally answered my questions. I mean, it wasn't even an answer. It was an attack. You know, they wanted to know, well, what kind of contamination is in the, in, in the water? And um, could you tell me exactly what's this definition of dirtier air? I mean, it was just like, oh, my God. You know, rather than listening to the question and letting their heart impact their mind, and think about what I was trying to ask. But what this lesson tells me is that if we don't have to work on our arguments or our information, that stuff is already out there for anybody who wants it and irrelevant for those who don't want to listen. However, all great struggles, all of them, have, or movements actually, have equality at their core, not some strategy for accommodation over time. The American Revolution was a struggle you know, by men in this country you know, to, for their own freedom, 
away from British rule. Abolitionists fought to end slavery on the basis of the equality that the founding fathers you know, established. Uh, the rights for blacks and white women to vote was a huge struggle that strove for equality. Forty years after MLK shared his dream, we have a black president. Until, of course, he screws up and then he's half white. <laughs> I'm glad you realize that's a joke. <laughs> Kinda. <laughs> but it would seriously, you know, work. <laughs> but were any of these movements perfect? No. God, no. Of course not. But they were steps in the right direction, and each successive movement started to get bigger and bolder in their request you know, for equality. Equality was put down on paper in, in, in 1776, and it grew larger than the guys who actually wrote their John Hancocks, okay, put it down. You know, the framers of that Constitution were not thinking about equality for their wives at home or non-landowners or, or slaves. But those folks were thinking about it for themselves. And that's what happens. Today, as in the past, certain people are not considered as valuable as others. Poor people of any color, and every color, are considered burdens, problems to be solved. I know, because I am one of them. The lack of value that society places on people is exemplified by the environmental sacrifice zones where these people live. If my air or water or day-to-day -day experience is dirtier or uglier or in any way less healthy than another's, that's not equality. That's environmental injustice. Inequality has allowed for a single-purpose, dirty infrastructure because in the absence of meeting the challenge of equality, we fall back on less sophisticated methods of accomplishing our goals, such as burning coal and oil to get the job done. On a, both a global as well as a local scale, it's the environment that ties us all together. Our single-purpose tactics of planning and design have been as bad for the people in the immediate area as they've been for greenhouse gas production. If we had placed our transport, waste, and energy infrastructure near wealthy people as quickly and easily as we've done near poor people, we would have had a clean and green economy decades ago. But think about it. You know, who lives near mega hog farms or mountaintop removal coal mines or coal-burning power plants, an oil refinery, an interstate highway or a sewage treatment facility? I mean... Would you want to help influence their design if you did? Of course. Now, you may remember the broken windows theory that um, Giuliani, during his mayoral administration in New York City, implemented. Um, you know, and, and it's part of the theory is that you know, if you do things like uh, you, if buildings that are left in vandalized conditions, you know, broken windows, et cetera, um, they breed more crime and lawlessness than those kept up, even if it's only on a surface level. And, you know, he was a bit fascist about it, but there was a bit of a, but some truth to it. There really was. Um, but I actually have a better idea, which is called the broken branches theory. And that brings to bear studies, you know, that document the value of social benefits and environmental services provided by healthy, robust horticultural infrastructure. You know, short trees, you know, green open space, stuff like that. And, um, excuse me. Now, why am I so interested in this? Well, in a few years... More than 70% of the world's population is going to live in urban areas. Um, and I believe that city infrastructure has to be more like 21st century TED. It has to be multi-purpose. It has to provide a service to all different levels of government, the businesses that operate across them, the people who live nearby. Our tax dollars are used now to subsidize dirty energy infrastructure. Uh, but poor people are the ones that generally have to live with it more often than not. They turn out to be also a highly expensive group of people as a result. We know that fossil fuel emissions lead to poor air quality, which exacerbates respiratory conditions like asthma. The negligent urban planning that isolates these facilities in poor communities makes them less conducive for physical activity more prone to lifestyle-related conditions such as asthma and obesity. We also know that proximity to fossil fuel emissions actually cause learning disabilities in young kids. 
And we know now that statistically poor children that do poorly in school have a much better chance of going on to jail rather than on to higher education. So the taxpayers who subsidize a few people who get rich on dirty industry are also the same taxpayers who pay on the other end for the public health, jails, law enforcement, poor educational outcomes, and all the social problems connected with an unhealthy environment. It's a big cost, much bigger than the short-term advantage we think we're getting. But that also means that that is also a great point source for savings, which we need whether you believe in equality or not. So it turns out that when we try for environmental equality, the environment works for us in a lot better ways than, we tried to, than if we try to engineer our way out around it. Climate change is coming, okay? Clearly, everybody, I'm sure, knows that. Um, and even if we all do exactly what Al Gore said when he was elected president nine years ago, <laughs> you know, it's still be coming down the pipe, all right? It's, it's true. It wouldn't be as awful as it is right now, but it, 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 still, it would still suck badly. So um, I have to stop saying that word in public. I, <laughs> it could be worse, though. Um, <laughs> but, for example... We know climate change is coming down the pipe, totally, we know that. And stormwater management, you know, that would be pumping rainwater and sewage in and out of our systems. Clearly not a particularly sexy topic at all, but with climate changing, um, we'll see more intense storm waters, storms and higher energy costs associated with that operating, that infrastructure. So diverting a gallon of water, actually, from entering the sewage system is much more cost effective than trying to deal with it at the end of the pipe and just recognize that, you know, we do that billions and billions and billions of gallons every single day. Every single major city in this country does that. So though that kind of money really seriously adds up. Um, and that op stuff is actually was published in an EPA report under the Bush administration back in 2007. So I'm not making any of this stuff up, really, not at all. So, but how do we do this? How do we, like factor in all this stuff and actually make it cheaper for us to participate in this. Well, horticultural infrastructure. We cover surfaces with green, real green, photosynthetic machines that prevent erosion by actually holding soil in place, clean the air, reduce urban heat island temperatures, and give people green jobs because, you know, like my friend, friend Van Jones says, it's like little green fairies are not going to come down, you know, and do this kind of stuff, this kind of, these green jobs for you. People got to do it. Fortunately, so and, you know, and I'm talking urban forestry, green roof installation, um, learning to clean up contaminated land so that no extra dirty waters are going into um, our ecosystem that way, and even restoring wetlands. And yes, you can do this all in urban areas. Healthy wetlands actually act as the horizontal levees during a big storm. You know, in fact, Hurricane Katrina was not as big a storm as Hurricane Betsy was, that happened, the one that preceded it 40 years before. It wasn't, but one major thing happened. All of the, the wetlands that were, most of the wetlands that were there, you know, in that region, the size of the state of Delaware had been removed in that 40-year period. So the natural defenses, you know, of that region to actually help slow the tide, that and, of course, that the levees were all screwed up, you know, in the first place because that's, they didn't do that well in poor communities. But the point is those natural, that natural horticultural infrastructure that is wetlands Actually, they absorbed some, much of that water long before man-made systems like the levees were even, even have to go to work. And, you know, maybe it's because where I'm from that I can be pretty gosh darn optimistic about the huge problems that we're facing because, you know, I grew up and continue to live in a place that was, has always been an environmental and economic crisis. Always. And uh, otherwise known as the South Bronx in New York City. But, frankly, every city has its own South Bronx. East of Truce is where it would be, you know, in, in Kansas City. Um, but every zip code has its few zip codes, you know, where you'll find the poor environmental conditions, no jobs or very few poverty, you know, a majority of the state's incarcerated population that resides there before and then right after, they, and go right back there after they come out of prison before they go back again. And there's also, clearly, with all that going on, a huge deficit of hope. 
Are these single-purpose people? Is it their purpose to be a burden? I don't think so. We're going into some major long-term debt right now as a country in order to stimulate our economy. Governments regularly, regularly take on 10 to 20 year bond issues to fund things like stormwater management projects you know, or stadiums. And actually that's how I first became familiar with, with Kansas City. But my point is, is that there is always money. The question is, are we going to direct our money you know, towards some long term solution, a real solution? Or are we going to build, are we going to build up our working class you know, so they can become middle class? Or are we going to fund somebody's pet project like a stadium? You know, coming off the heels of New York City actually spending a billion dollars, you know, of taxpayer dollars, um, you know, to, to finance the New York Yankees, you know, their new sports team, their new sports stadium, which they built on top of one of the only public parks, you know, in the South Bronx, mind you. Um, so, yeah, they got a lot, we got a lot more stadium seats that year than we did classroom seats, but, you know, it, yeah, life goes, is a little annoying sometimes. But the point is, we need taxpayers to help us deal with that debt, not tax burdens. And right now, we're setting ourselves up to accumulate more and more tax burdens because of the social costs associated with them. So this is the time that we can insist that any publicly fine, any publicly guaranteed debt must have broader social benefits built into any of the project that that debt is to serve to support. And I know a couple things about how to do that. And this is something that we could start to do right now. Business development opportunities and horticultural infrastructure have only begun to be explored as a solution to remediate the environment and also alleviate poverty. Small businesses are the market assets to get the job done while creating varied and flexible employment throughout our communities. Imagine, you know, we have huge underground um, entrepreneurs, you know, in many poor communities around this, this, this country. Wouldn't it be amazing to take those same kind of great skills that actually, you know, pardon me, I hope none of you like, consider this particularly off color, but, um, you know, but the point is, you know, I'm sorry, but if a guy can, like, stay out of jail for a while running a successful drug business, I think we can teach homeboy or girl of any color, you know, how to operate a legitimate business. So, and I, and I know this on, on a whole other level as well, because back in 2003, a lot before everybody was really talking about green anything, and believe it, nobody was talking about that in the South Bronx. Um, you know, I started one of the nation's first green-collar job training and placement systems. And, you know, after many, like, well, what is that? Um, you know, it was, it was fine, because we knew it was called the Bronx Environmental Stewardship Training Program, or BEST. And, uh, you know, we took in some of the most difficult-to-employ people, folks that, you know, had criminal records, you know, folks that had years of generational poverty. I mean, folks that actually hadn't even had the experience of having a family member with a job in their household. And so, you know, that stuff is not, you know, it's, you're not like born knowing how to be, you know, um, how to go to work. You know, you learn that from seeing it happen, and you, you have to teach that kind of stuff. But we were able, you know, to give them the skills in environmental restoration because that was what we were trying to do in our own community. And, you know, so, but you had to see, like, a single mom, you know, on, on, who'd been on welfare almost all of her life and recognize that she could do some great stuff as well. So we taught them, you know, in terms of green roof installation, wetland restoration, to build the parks that we had been advocating for instead of the garbage dumps that, that, that the city wanted to build on them. Um, you know, we uh, gave them also the soft skills so that folks would know, you know, how to show up on time for a job, how to be a leader in their own life, how to, like, manage, a, how to, uh, what do you call it? I'm embarrassed to say. Um, balance a checkbook. That's it. Stuff... <laughs> It's like, man, whoa. Anyway, all those things. And, um, you know, so that they could actually take some pride in, in having some control over their own lives. And it really was amazing to watch how people would come alive to the world around them when they understood that they not only had, you know, some money in their pocket that was legitimately earned, but also that they were able to do something that they knew was making their community and the world a better place. That is real power. The kind that makes you just go, oh my gosh, we, you know, we can do anything you know, as, 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 as human beings living in, on this life. If, if folks who felt so powerless when they walked into a room understood that they can use the power that they didn't even know they had 
as a force for good. And so we were just so excited about seeing all that. And that's why I know that what we need to do is start investing more, you know, in horticultural infrastructure assets um, and the people who have the most to gain by doing these types of jobs. Because then now, you know, it's like the studies that, that, that really got me interested in this work was actually a study from the University of Illinois, the Laboratory for Landscape and Human Health, um, they did these studies that looked at Cabrini Green, okay, um, one of the most notorious housing projects in all of the country, um, out in Chicago. And they noticed that people that lived near, even if it was just like a little spindly group of little street trees in the projects, that the people who lived near them, that the crime rate there, they had lower crime rates, that teenage girls got pregnant less, that kids in school did better in those areas. You know, and that people in the area had more community pride because they would actually be outside more, hanging out with each other, like building community with each other. And, and it was the only difference that they saw between there and other places in the area was the presence you know, of this little bit of an urban forest. You know, and we realized that horticultural therapy in particular, you know, it's, it's actually a tool that's used to help people that are really traumatized, you know, folks that are coming back from war coming out of prison, you know, those um, that are dealing with years of generational poverty as well. You know, and these, those folks actually have some of our greatest, the most expensive citizens that we have out there, and giving those people the opportunity to deal with our environmental problems, to be the solutions to the problems that we have, actually gives us a great value, you know, to the dollar. You know, we have the power in this room to make better decisions happen, and we certainly have the need it's not about more money. It's about how we use it to create more equality. Because when we use our gifts to solve more complex problems of poverty and the environment at the same time, we unlock the keys to much more powerful solutions. Now is the time to stop building tributes to our collective failures and start creating living monuments. People. People who are monuments of hope and possibility. Isn't that the legacy that we all want to leave our grandkids? You know, I hope for the chance to build some of these with you. You know, because back in 2007, starting right here in Kansas City, you know, I saw an unprecedented level, you know, of corporate, you know, and, and um, philanthropic giving and, and widening gaps, you know, in health and income disparity, education and incarceration and other things that all this philanthropy was supposed to be solving. So that did push me you know, to think about where, what else I could be doing. And I did start a consulting firm that allowed me you know, to really build on the pioneering experiences that we started in the South Bronx. Because um, I asked the question, you know, how can we help unlock some potential in every place? You know, we were brought into the northeastern North Carolina region first, which was a little strange because it is so rural and wouldn't seem to have much in common with the South Bronx. But it's also very poor you know, and as such, looks very attractive to noxious industries um, that tend to stay away from more affluent communities. You know, that region is also actually third only to the Mississippi Delta and the Florida Everglades for the area of the country that's going to be most impacted by sea level rise. So we're working with them to become real leaders in climate adaptation strategies. And later we began working in, in New Orleans in the Lower Ninth with Brad Pitt's group to help design, you know, a, um, a green-collar job training program for them. And we also got the pleasure of working with Kansas City's own um, BNIM, the architecture and planning firm there as well, because we're really hoping, yes? Because we really want to make sure that, and be a part, you know, of native Lower Ninth residents actually rebuilding the, the Lower Ninth as it should be done properly. And we're also real excited that we're going to be working in Detroit so, and helping you know, folks there see that you know, Motown could actually become Mo Green Town. <laughs> so, because we, all we do is assume you know, that equality is a commonly held goal and that we apply that energy to encourage others to see that their self-interest will actually be met by believing the same thing. We can get away from a single purpose mind, limited ideal, um, in every aspect of our life. And it does feel really good to feel that way. For me, it was helping my community and myself 
and see real value in myself and in others, but not stopping there. Because there are problems everywhere, but there are solutions hiding behind the eyes of countless individuals. You know, I get really nice introductions like the one that Mike just gave me um, you know, earlier, and a lot, but I have to tell you, on some level, it still kind of makes me feel a little uncomfortable. My husband says that I have an EDD, Entitlement Deficit Disorder. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but it, it, and, and that is probably true, but... On some level, it, I also know that everybody, whether or not they're standing up on stage presenting to a really beautiful group of people, that everybody has something to give, everybody on this planet. And I want folks to know that you know, we all have, the, have great power to do our jobs, participate in our family lives, make our world better for lots of people, even if you've never, ever met them. Um, because we can all be bodhisattvas. You know, right? And you think about it, you know, like a person like Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. who was just, you know, 41 years ago, you know, assassinated for deeply held beliefs that he acted upon, um, you know, and that he had that amazing speech, that prophetic speech right before he died. You know, and he looked over the mountaintop and he looked out and saw the promised land. You know, but the thing is, Dr. King was so not alone. We were all there. And the promised land that he saw wasn't black or white or red, or yellow, or brown, or some beautiful combination of any of those. It was green. And it has to be, because we are now in the, firmly entrenched in the Obama era. And I do not mean just the lovely man and his fabulous wife that you know, now <laughs> occupy in the, um, the White House. Obama is an acronym that I created, and it stands for Officially Behaving as Magnificent Americans. Your turn. Thank you.